Good afternoon and welcome. I am Angela Gonzalez Perez, the Vice President of Operations here at NYP Hudson Valley Hospital. NYP Hudson Valley Hospital is your community hospital and we proudly offer a complete range of inpatient and ambulatory programs with expertise in all areas of medicine. Within our doors, you'll find some of the nation's top doctors in advanced technology and award-winning care in a compassionate, patient-centered environment. We proudly offer advanced care close to home. Throughout our enterprise, we have been inviting employees and the community to celebrate, learn, and show support for our LGBTQ colleagues, friends, and allies which includes representatives of all ethnicities, nationalities, religions, and more. As we celebrate NYP Pride, Together We Thrive, we reflect on the importance of continuing to nurture our resilience in the face of COVID-19, racial and social injustice, and the ongoing challenges faced by the LGBTQ plus people. I am delighted to be part of this afternoon's Pride Month event featuring our own Chef Emily and a special guest, Michael Sellers. Today's program, A Community Conversation and Healthy Recipes is reflective of the employee-led diversity and inclusion groups that lead programming efforts on all of our campuses. We are presenting today's program in partnership with Peak Skill Pride. And I'd like to give a big shout out to Benjamin Lukens, our hospital pharmacist, who is also a board member of Peace Skill Pride. We are pleased to be joined by Michael Sellers, owner and baker at Journeyman Bakery in Peekskill, who has been part of our hospital's farmer's market since 2018. Michael was named best, bread, best new bread baker by Westchester Magazine and teaches bread baking classes online throughout the year. We can find Michael in his popular bakery at 638 Central Avenue in Peekskill, so write that down, on Wednesdays and Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. To learn more, go to his website, journeymanbakery.com. As he tells us, Michael's love for bread is matched only by his desire to discover new ways to foster community and guarantee equal access to high quality food through the act of bacon. Michael will be sharing his personal journey as a gay man and how his own bakery has played a role in fostering the community in Peekskill. Thank you, Chef Emily and Michael. We are looking forward to learning new recipes and seeing how to make journeyman's delicious cinnamon rolls. Take it away, Michael. Thank you, Angela. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Sellers, as Angela said. I am the owner and baker of Journeyman Bakery at 638 Central Avenue here in Peekskill. Um, I have in front of me here whoops, uh, an example of the cinnamon rolls that I'm going to be showing you how we make today. Um, these are from a recipe developed by King Arthur Flour. We introduced cinnamon rolls at the bakery about um, seven or eight months ago and they were a huge hit. Uh, we sell them only on Saturday mornings, so if you plan on coming by, uh, make sure it's only on a Saturday. Um, it's a very simple recipe, but there are a few unique elements of it that I thought I would show you, just so when you try these at home, um, you won't get stuck at any point in the recipe. I know uh, either you have the recipe or you'll be given a link to the recipe at some point today. As I said, it's based on one that was published by King Arthur Baking in Vermont. That's where I had all my, um, my baker training. Just a, a quick recap on Journeyman. Journeyman was founded in 2016 as a bread by subscription business. People would place their orders online and then every Friday I would go out and deliver the bread in my car all over Westchester. That got to be a little untenable after a while and after particip participating in an incubator program in 2020, um, I decided to open a brick and mortar bakery here in Peekskill at the site of the former Zeph's restaurant at 638 Central Avenue. Um, we only do bread and cinnamon rolls and occasionally other treats. And once every few months, we turn into a pizzeria for one night and do pizzas. Uh, we just did a very successful one on Sunday night for Father's Day pizza. 
um, 100 pizzas in three hours. So if I look a little tired, that could be why. Um, so I'm just going to go right into the recipe and show you. I'm not going to do all the mixing and all the detail stuff because that's very basic and um, uh, it'd be very easy to do that at home. I just want to show you some of the techniques. So again, here are the, the cinnamon rolls that we're going to be making. When you make cinnamon rolls free form like this, that means rolling them out and then putting it on a sheet pan and letting them bake individually, they tend to spread wide and not get very hot. If you're like me, I prefer cinnamon rolls to be a little more lofty. So if I were you, I would probably bake these in a muffin tin, a greased muffin tin, so that it contains the, the, the diameter, but it gives it a lot more loft. And they're a lot more fun to eat that way when they're a little, um, a little bigger. It's totally a personal choice, but that would be my recommendation. The first thing to note about this recipe is its first ingredient, which is called a tangzong. Tangzong is um, a technique that was developed in Japan about a decade ago. It's when we take uh, flour, mix it with a liquid, and pre-bake it or pre-cook it. By doing that, we gelatinize the starches in the flour, and it helps keep the dough very, very moist. So as long as you don't overbake these rolls, they will stay soft and pillowy for about two or three days, which is really unique for cinnamon rolls, which tend to stale very fast. The, the first piece of advice I want to give you is if you're going to do any baking at home, please, please get a digital scale. They're only about $30. You can get them a lot cheaper than that on Amazon. Uh, most recipes these days come in uh, metric and occasionally with ounces and pounds um, in parentheses. Um, using metric is 100 times easier. It's a way to share recipes with other bakers so that we all understand the same, uh, the same measurements. So the first thing I'm gonna do is look at my recipe and it's calling for 113 grams of whole milk and 23 grams of unbleached bread flour. So I'm putting my cold pan on the scale I'm gonna add my 113 grams of whole milk. I'm zeroing out the scale and then placing my 23 grams of flour. Now, regarding flour, I would uh, tell you to use, I would suggest that you use King Arthur bread flour or really any brand of bread flour, but King Arthur uh, is uh, very stable and is likely to perform best. You can get it in most supermarkets in a blue and white bag. Um, bread flour has a little more protein and will give you more loft in the rolls than all-purpose flour will. So once I have the flour in the milk, I stir it up to get the lumps out, and then I put it on medium-high heat. And I keep stirring it. So as you can see now, hopefully, it's, it's really a liquid. It's very, very loose. It's more like milk. But as I stir it over the heat, the flour will begin to cook and it will start to thicken. You know, in other types of cooking, uh, we might call this a roux or a white sauce at the base of a, a bechamel, although our bechamel has um, butter in it as well. But by cooking this, cooking the flour like this, it's cooking and gelatinizing the starches in the flour. So when it hits the raw flour and the rest of the recipe, it's able to absorb it more readily and keep the dough nice and moist. Here at Journeyman, we do a lot of breads using sourdough. It's important to note that this is not a sourdough. This is called a pre-ferment. So a sourdough would be, you know, letting flour and water uh, ferment for several days until it starts to bubble and grow. This we're pre-cooking, so it would not be considered a sourdough. And just like that, if you can see it here, you'll start to see that I can actually move it away from the bottom of the pan and it sticks. It's very much like a paste. Take it off the heat so it doesn't burn. Give it a final mix to make sure you don't have any lumps. Let me see if I can bring some out for you. I'll put it here on the bench. It's very much like a, like a thick paste, like, um, Mashed potatoes, I guess, or wallpaper paste, if anyone still does that. Um, that's exactly the, uh, the way you want it. Just, it hangs off the, the spatula, doesn't drip, 
and it's perfect for use. So once you do that, you add that and all the other ingredients that are in the recipe, which include milk, butter, sugar, salt, and instant yeast into your mixing bowl. Um, I suggest you use instant yeast and not active dry yeast. Um, instant yeast is treated so that it's able to go to work very, very quickly, and you don't need to soak it in water beforehand like you do with active dry yeast. Once you get it all in the bowl, you have to do a lot of mixing. If you're mixing by hand, you're going to be mixing for about 15 minutes. If you're mixing with a KitchenAid stand mixer, you're probably going to mix for about 10 to 12 minutes using a dough hook. It's very important that you mix this a long time so that you develop the gluten network in the dough. You'll know that you started to develop the gluten because when you pull out the dough, it starts to stretch, and those are the gluten strands that are stretching. Now, I made some dough a little earlier. I'll just put it here. I'm gonna show you how I roll it out to actually make the rolls. When you're working with this kind of dough, you have to be careful with it that you don't tear it. And you also don't want to use tons of flour on your, on your counter, just enough to keep it from sticking. Hi, Michael. This is Ellen Bloom from Community Affairs. I have a couple of questions that just came in. One is a question about whether um, can nut milk be used instead of whole milk? And if so, which, is, which one is the best to substitute? That's a really good question. And uh, yes, it can, but I, I wouldn't know which brand would be the best one. Okay. If you wanted to, you could, use, you could use water instead of milk if you have a milk allergy. It will still work. Great. And then how long can regular or instant yeast last in the freezer? Oh, indefinitely. Great. Yeah, it could easily. I've had yeast for a couple of years in the freezer and it's been fine. If you. You, if you choose to use Fresh baker's yeast it usually comes in a, a cakey form. You can still get it in the supermarket, in the refrigerated section. Um, just use, um, here it calls for two teaspoons of instant yeast. You would want to use um, probably five teaspoons of fresh. Um, uh, fresh is not as concentrated as the instant yeast. Uh, but I would suggest using the powdered instant. It's much easier to work with and more, um, more predictable. So what I've, I've taken the dough and I've put it into a rough rectangle form here on the bench. You don't want an oval, you don't want a circle, you wanna keep it as much of a rectangle as you can. A little more flour on top of the dough and then you wanna take your rolling pin, put a little flour on that and then just gently start to roll out the dough. Now, when the dough is properly risen, it usually takes about 90 minutes for it to rise. This has risen for about two hours. It'll get very relaxed. And all I have to do is really just kind of touch it a little bit and it immediately pushes out. If you're ever working with the dough and it fights you and you push and it, it springs back, that means that the dough um, needs to relax. The gluten is too active. So you would just cover it with plastic, let it sit for 15 or 20 minutes and then come back to it. All right, so at this point, I've got a rectangle that's probably about 14 inches by 10 inches. I think they, they suggest a little smaller in the recipe, but you can experiment. And the thicker the dough, the thicker the, um, the rolls are going to be. Once I get it at that stage, you have two options. I'm gonna use water in a spray bottle. You could also use melted butter at this point, but we have to dampen the dough so that the cinnamon sugar mixture is going to stick to it. The recipe has all the information for this. This is brown sugar, flour, a little bit of salt, um, and melted butter. The melted butter just gets absorbed by the brown sugar and it helps with the flavoring. We add flour so that when the sugar melts, it doesn't drizzle out all over the baking sheet. It actually turns into a syrup and stays thick. So I'm gonna just spritz the dough to make it moist. Just check it. Again, you can do this with a pastry brush and beaten egg whites uh, with melted butter. Um, anything that's gonna get the sugar to stick to it. And very generously, 
put the sugar on top of the dough, making sure that the dough stays in that rectangular shape. If you wanted to, at this point, you could add raisins. Um, I wouldn't add a lot, but you could just sprinkle those on top. Sometimes they burst when you're using them for cinnamon rolls. We're then gonna start with the long side closest to you of the dough and just a really easy flip, turning it over by about an inch. And then very gently from one side, start rolling it and then to the middle and then to the other side. It's usually so loose that you can't roll it all at once in one shot until you've got a couple of turns under your belt. And at this point, then I can start to push. And as long as I've floured the deck enough, the dough should roll into a log shape like I have here. You want to pinch off the seam that you're gonna have. When you hit the top, the seam will appear. You wanna pinch it off before it has any chance to let go of any of the sugar mixture. If it's loose, it will open up while it's baking and all the sugar will ooze out over the baking sheet. So as I wipe my brow, I will tell you that this is, the next part is my favorite part of this recipe because it usually surprises people that you could use a knife or uh, kitchen shears to cut these, but the best possible thing you can use is dental floss. Um, do not make the mistake that I did last week of getting um, flavored dental floss. All of the cinnamon rolls tasted like mint. It was not very pretty. Um, <laughs> wax is fine, uh, as this one is. And don't get dental tape. That won't work. But you want a really strong dental floss. And you lift up the dough, put the floss underneath. And I know this will be a little hard to see, but you're just going to cross the floss over the top and pull. And it cuts question. it like a knife. When you spray the dough with water, it, do you know how, could you just say how much water you're recommending? Oh, I'd say maybe at the most two tablespoons. Thank you. You really don't need much water. It's just enough to get the, the sugar to stick to the dough. And then you're going to put the floss under every time you make a cut. Sometimes it helps to flour it. And about an inch and a half, you're going to go along and cut just these little logs. Oops. Let me see if I can get you a, a good example of one here. Here you can start to see, you can see the spiral shape in the, um, in the dough with the sugar. We'll move these. You want to have prepared a baking sheet with a piece of parchment on it or a baking sheet that's been sprayed liberally with um, vegetable spray like tan. And then you take the little cut pieces, put them on the baking sheet. Hopefully you can see. And then just give them a little press down to get them more into a circular shape. You'll find that the dough is wider in the center of the log than it is at the ends. And those are probably gonna end up being the better cinnamon rolls in the end. Ideally, you wanna have the log be the same width all along, all along the way. But that takes a little bit of practice. So I've got six right here. This recipe will probably do about nine. If you want to do big, like Cinnabon type cinnamon rolls, I suggest doubling the recipe and uh, just do everything else after that because with more dough, you'll get bigger, puffier rolls. Here you can see the six rolls in their basic shape. Again, I press them down, not too hard, just enough to get them a little flat like hockey pucks. Then I would cover this with plastic and put it in a warm place for about an hour, hour and a half. And you'll see them almost double in size. They should get wider and taller. Again, if you want um, very tall, high loaves, like a cinnamon style, cook it in a muffin pan that's been greased. If you don't really mind that, it spreads out a little bit and gets more of like a, a pinwheel look, then let bake it flat like this 
and you'll get uh, you'll get this guy, this kind of shape here. A little flatter, still delicious, still nice and soft, but um, it just gets a little wider and flatter. These will bake for about uh, 15 minutes at a 375 oven. Um, once they come out of the oven, it's great if you have some melted butter on hand and just take a pastry brush and wipe them with the melted butter. It really improves the taste. Once you're done with that, there is a, a part of the recipe that includes um, a recipe for white icing or sugar icing. That's what we use here in the bakery. We also do a honey walnut roll, um, which is the exact same dough and the exact same preparation, but we end up soaking it in a honey walnut mixture uh, prior to baking it. Um, let me use one of the... When it comes to icing the rolls, you wanna let them cool first. If you do them while they're hot, the icing is gonna melt. That's not so bad if you want it to get to thin down and get into all the little crevices. It'll still taste fine, but you won't get um, an opaque look. So sometimes I dip them, dip them right in the, in the sugar like that. Other times I'll use a pastry brush and paint it on. A lot of times uh, the first coat will seep in and go down all the crevices and you'll lose a lot of it. And it's good to come around a second time with the pastry brush and dress it up before you serve them. Um, these will keep um, in a plastic bag in the kitchen for two or three days. You could freeze them after they've baked and they'll last um, weeks and weeks. Um, I've kept them up to eight weeks and they still tasted fine. You just want to either zap them in a microwave or put them in a 250 oven for about 10 minutes and they're wrapped in foil. Um, the biggest thing about these rolls is they, they need moisture. So they'll have enough moisture if you keep them in a plastic bag or if you keep them in a uh, piece of foil that's all tented and, and bound at the top. They'll create their own steam and they'll re-soften. They do the same thing in a microwave. With a microwave, you want to uh, zap it on high for about 12 to 15 seconds. It really will depend on the, the, the power of your microwave. And that will soften up the inside and get the icing to, to melt a little bit. Um, that is the, the basics of, of cinnamon rolls. If you were to, uh, if you wanted to try the honey walnut, you would do the exact same thing, except you would have to use muffin tins. And in the bottom of each muffin tin, you pour a little honey, some brown sugar, and some crushed walnuts. And then each piece of dough would sit right in the muffin tin and bake with that honey underneath. When it's all baked and it comes out of the oven, you immediately flip it out onto a serving platter and all the honey and um, nuts drizzle over the top of the roll once it's removed from the, the muffin pan. Um, I'm trying to think if I've forgotten anything. I think that's it. My, my biggest thing is uh, use bread flour and if you can find it, there's a lot of butter in this recipe. There are no eggs. For the butter, it really does make a difference if you use European butter, which really means that it has 83% butter fat. Uh, American butter tends to have um, like about 78 or 79%. The, the brands in the store that you can find are uh, Plugra, uh, Kerry is another one. Uh, they're expensive, but they're definitely worth it for a treat like this. If you wanted to, you could make the rolls in advance. And prior to putting them in the oven, you could put the whole sheet pan in the freezer and freeze them overnight, and then just take them out in the morning, let them defrost, and then bake them off. Um, they might not rise as high, but it's a way to kind of do a lot of the work in advance and just bake them off when you're ready. Uh, the final thing I'll say is if you don't want to use a baking sheet, and you wanna maybe take them to someone else's house, you can bake them in a square or a round uh, cake pan. If you use like an eight inch round pan, you nestle them in the pan, leaving enough room for them to expand. Let them rise in that pan, bake them in that pan. And then when you serve them, everyone just goes in and pulls one out. And they'll, they'll be sticking to each other, but, but they'll pull apart okay. And those become like tear and share um, cinnamon rolls. Uh, that's another great way of doing it, and it's an easy way to uh, freeze uh, a whole set of rolls without taking up a lot of space in the freezer. Once the 
the dough is frozen prior to baking, and they become like little hockey pucks. You can take them out and throw them in a big Ziploc bag and just store them that way indefinitely and just bake them off whenever you're ready for, uh, for a party or when you're going to have guests. Um, I just wanted to say about uh, Journeyman, you know, I, re I named it uh, the business Journeyman for two reasons. Uh, a Journeyman is somebody who's just beyond the apprentice stage in, a, in any kind of job where uh, they have a master teaching them. So I not even near the stage, stage of master. But it, I also named it that way because I've been on a journey my entire life, um, trying, to, trying to follow my passion wherever I could. Initially, that took me into the Peace Corps and then um, into the marketing world and hospitals all throughout New York City. And then five years ago, uh, totally changed my life and became a, a full-time bread baker. So uh, I'm living proof that it's never too old to change. Um, you can always make a difference. Um, I try to support my community as much as I can. And um, I'm very grateful for all the support we've received from Peak Steel residents and visitors who come down Central Avenue on their way to the train, stop and buy bread and rolls on the weekend and take it home with them. Um, we've heard about our bread going as far south as uh, New Orleans and as far east as France. Someone took it on a trip there and gave it to family. So um, I just want to thank you folks for tuning in and watching for the opportunity to, uh, to do this demonstration for you. I'm happy to take any questions. Michael, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, and I see some comments about how delicious the cinnamon rolls are from the bakery and maybe a little bit easier than um, making them at home. So we encourage people <laughs> to visit your bakery for the top cinnamon rolls in Peekskill and the surrounding communities. And with that, we will thank you. Please stay with us in case there are other questions. And um, oh, one quick question, are you open every day? No, we're open Wednesdays and Saturdays. Um, just to note, this week we are not open on Wednesday. We're not open tomorrow, just on Saturday. But the other days we're baking wholesale breads, so we're not open to the public on those days. Just Wednesdays and Saturdays, 9 a.m. to 3, 8, 3 p.m. Thank you so much. And with that, we're going to turn the attention over to Emily to continue with the recipe presentation. Thank you so much, Ellen. And thank you, um, Michael, for your wonderful sharing of your cinnamon roll recipe. I, I can't wait to try them. They just look amazing. And I've heard such rave reviews. Um, so thank you, everybody, to join, for joining us today to celebrate Pride and to Pride Ex Peak Skill as well as um, Angela for welcoming us all and making this such a special event. Michael, you really are uh, a special part of the fabric of this community and your bakery is simply the best in town. So I'm so honored to be sharing this stage with you today. Um, today, I'm going to be making a strawberry basil and yogurt parfait to complement your cinnamon rolls, something uh, a little bit sweet also. And, um, you know, using the fruits that are in season from our very own organic garden here at New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley. Strawberries are mainly made of water. They also contain some fiber and fructose, which is the naturally occurring fruit sugar. They're a great source of vitamin C, which is helpful for supporting the immune system. And they also contain potassium, which is a great mineral that um, is very useful for regulating blood pressure, um, as, as well as being high in antioxidants. So these are our gorgeous bowl of berries. And you can see we've got a really big one here. This might be the biggest strawberry I've ever seen come out of our garden. And um, what we're going to do today, really, really simple, is we're going to chop up some basil, um, chop up some strawberries, add a little bit of maple syrup and lime zest. And we're gonna do what's called macerating, which means to let these strawberries sit in their syrup for about 20 minutes or so. And you can see what that does there. You can see this lovely little um, pool of juices here at the bottom. That's all really great strawberry flavor. So you're gonna have these berries and you can do this ahead of time. You can let them sit for you know a day or so in these, um, flavors and they just get to hang out and, and produce really lovely, um, lovely fruit. And um, so very, very simple. This is uh, definitely a nice compliment to your cinnamon roll, Michael. Um, you're just going to start by taking your strawberries, 
and taking off the top green part, you can either use your paring knife to trim that away, or you can cut um, sort of in, into the strawberry. And then I like to use um, a smaller knife when I'm doing this, because it just, I feel like when I'm working with something small like a strawberry, it's a little bit more control than the big chef's knives. So I'm just cutting them in half, and then you wanna just do a nice little dice. So we're going to add this to a bowl. Um, you want to do, you know, depending on how many people you're making this for, you can do a good amount. So again, working with a flat surface, cutting through, you know, you can quarter them, you can cut them, everything about the same size, more or less. I know um, some people actually eat the green part of the strawberry. It is an edible portion of the plant. I don't think it tastes very good, but if you're really, really into eating your greens, <laughs> then I guess you could add strawberry tops to the list. So here you go, chopping all of those up and, um, and then simply adding a little bit of lime zest. So you want to get your zester out, get your lime ready. Um, whenever you're zesting citrus, make sure that you wash and dry it really well. Um, you don't want to zest when the citrus is wet. It's going to get all clumpy. So you just want to dust until you get to um, where it turns a little bit lighter and Tail there. You don't want to go too far into the citrus because if you do that, this white part, which is called the pith, it's really bitter. So you don't want to go too far in. So just keep rotating your lime as you go to get all the good green stuff. And again, you're adding more vitamin C with the zest here. Okay. So very simple. We've got our strawberries. We've got our zest. We're going to add a little drop of maple syrup. I did, I did an itsy bitsy amount for the demonstration. So I'm just going to add like a teaspoon. And then you're also going to add some big, beautiful basil. So these are, again, basil leaves from our garden. Um, basil is a leafy green herb that originated in Asia and Africa. Uh, it's a member of the mint family. I wish it would grow as wildly as mint does because it's such a wonderful um, plant. So it's a member of the mint family. It has many different varieties. The most uh, popular common variety is known as sweet basil, which is used a lot in Italian cuisine. Other varieties include, uh, maybe you've heard of Greek basil or Thai basil. Um, there's also cinnamon basil, which has a distinct cinnamon flavor, and lettuce basil, which is a little bit bigger than this and can kind of be torn up and used in salads. Um, basil contains vitamin A, K, as well as calcium, iron, and manganese, and wonderful antioxidants. It has anti-inflammatory components. So it's really a small little humble herb, but it really packs a punch. Um, you can grow basil anywhere where the nighttime temperatures are above 60 degrees. Um, so it has to be above 60 degrees for at least two months, and then basil can grow outside. Basil is particularly sensitive to cold, and likes sun exposure pretty much all day. So you can grow it from seed, or if you, you know, have a neighbor that has a great basil plant, you can cut a piece of their plant and um, stick it in some water, and eventually it will start to root. It'll, you'll see like little, um, little roots start to come out of the plant and you can plant that. So that's really fun. Um, it's a fun plant to share. And then finally, to encourage proper growth in your basil plant, you want to cut the stem towards the bottom to really allow the smaller leaves underneath to grow out. So if you have heaps of basil in your garden, because we're coming up on that time, um, it's a great thing to make pesto with, which you can freeze for the colder months where basil's not around. Um, you can also always dry the leaves and store them in a jar. I recommend storing them whole, you know, dried and whole instead of crumbling them and just crumble them right before you're going to use them. So they really retain their aroma and flavor. I didn't realize I had so much to say about basil. <laughs> so I'm just going to do what's called a chiffonade. And that means stacking the leaves up. Chiffon in French means a little rag. So we're going to stack them up like a little, uh, little pile here, stack the cards, and then you're just going to roll it like a tiny burrito. And use now we have this nice package, kind of like the cinnamon rolls, right? We have the same <laughs> effect here. And you're just going to use your knife to slice through to get these lovely little thin, thin, thin strips of basil. Okay, so this is a very um, classic technique called chiffonade. And you want to make sure whenever you're cutting your herbs that your knife is very sharp. Otherwise, it's going to bruise the herbs and not really cut all the way through. You're going to end up with a little puddle of herb juice, right? So you don't want that. You want the basil to retain all of its flavor and all of its juices. So there you go. 
you can add that to, that's a lot, the ratio that I'm adding is a lot, but that's okay. <laughs> you can add that to your berries, mix that all together, and then let it sit for about 20 minutes. It won't appear juicy at first, but then over time, you get this really lovely mixture. Do we have any questions or comments from our audience about that whole process? Everybody's doing okay? Yeah, no, Emily, we haven't uh, had any Thanks. comments except people are Thanks. very impressed with your beautiful strawberry bounty. Oh, I know. <laughs> that lovely. have been produced in our garden. I, um, I can take no credit for them. They just, they just love this rain and they just are really, really um, happy in their space. So the earth, the sun, and the rain have done everything. Um, so we're going to build our parfait. This is the fun part. You get to be creative. You can add granola into this if you'd like. Um, I like to use Greek yogurt or any kind of whole milk yogurt. Um, if you are, of course, uh, looking for a lower fat option, you can totally make this with a, um, you know, 0% Greek yogurt or a, you know, a low fat dairy, whichever you prefer. Um, it's totally up to you. And of course, yogurt is basically bacteria and milk, right? It's kind of strange to think of it that way, but it can be any kind of milk. So there's all kinds of plant-based yogurts now. I know someone had a question about substituting nut milk for the whole milk earlier. So same thing here. You can use any kind of yogurt that you enjoy. Um, I really like, there's a coconut yogurt that's delicious, even though I, I like dairy yogurt too. Um, so there's a lot of great options out there. Um, yogurt, of course, rich in calcium, B vitamins, magnesium, potassium, protein. So a lot of great things about it. Um, and then the most important, I think, being that it's high in probiotics, which are the live cultures, the friendly bacteria. If you're buying a yogurt and you look to the side and it doesn't say um, active live cultures, try to find yourself a yogurt that does say that. Um, and on the side here, it says uh, five live cultures and there's five different types of bacteria listed. That's really good because those are going to be the probiotic qualities that help your gut to flourish. And we know that when we have a flourishing microbiome, it impacts our entire health and, and wellness. So let's add a little bit of yogurt to the bottom. I like to kind of layer it in. So I do yogurt, then berries, then yogurt again, and kind of stack it in. It just looks really pretty when you, um, you know, serve it. So I'm using a little parfait glass here, but if you don't have a fancy cup like this, you can certainly um, maybe use a wine glass if you'd like. That's a nice way to serve this. Emily, what brand of yogurt is that? And is it organic? So the one I'm using today is called Brown Cow. So it's a non-GMO um, yogurt. And this one in particular is not an organic brand, but it is, it's a nice, nice yogurt that, um, that I think has a nice kind of, some yogurt can be really um, sour. So I kind of like that this one's not so sour. But if you have preferences um, for organic dairy, of course, you can feel free to use whatever yogurt you like in your household. So there you have it, our layered, beautiful parfait. And then if you want to add for some interesting sort of, we have the foundational flavors of the yogurt and the strawberries. If you want to add some textural component, maybe some crunch, feel free to add um, some nuts or seeds or uh, you know, a, a low sugar granola or something like that, or some fun embellishments. So I have some toasted sesame seeds here, which I think are kind of nice, um, both textural and kind of uh, make a nice counterpoint for the flavors in this dish. So really nice and simple. So um, with that, that is our yogurt parfait. I just want to thank everybody for, for joining us. And I'll turn it over to um, Ellen and Michael. Michael, our, um, we'd love to have some last words from you. And thank you, Emily. That was awesome. And that looks delicious. I wish I was up there with you right now. <laughs> Michael, so tell us a little bit more. I know you mentioned, so your bakery is located where in Peekskill? We are at 638 Central Avenue. It's uh, right up the street from Gaines Lumber on Central Ave. Uh, we have plenty of on-street parking. We are in the former kitchen of Zeps. We are not in the, in the actual restaurant side yet. Um, and we, we have a unique... Uh, traffic light in the window out front, it flashes green and red. Green, please walk in. Red, 
means that there's somebody in our space and we just ask you to wait outside until it turns green because we have such a, such a small retail area. Um, but we welcome anybody between nine and three, most Wednesdays and Saturdays, except for tomorrow we will, will be closed, but open nine to three this coming Saturday with lots of rolls, um, several different breads, and our menu changes every Sunday. So if you check our website, journeymanbakery.com, you'll see every bread that we, um, we offer week to week, and it takes about a month to cycle through our entire menu. And I'd like to offer Emily a job here at the bakery if she'd like one <laughs> to make, to make <laughs> more pays. Michael, oh, no. that's very, <laughs> that is not gonna happen. <laughs> very, very flattering, but I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> we are keeping Emily here. <laughs> Michael, oh, Emily. Thank you all very much. Angela Gonzalez Perez, our, our Vice President for Operations, um, on, on all of our behalfs, we thank everyone for joining us here today. New York Pride, together, NYP Pride, together we thrive is the theme for today. We thank you all, remind you that there's an event um, um, for Peekskill Pride on Saturday for families. And with that, we wanna thank you all for attending and joining us here today. We are so pleased and proud to bring you this program and look for all of our other programs on NYP Hudson Valley events. Thank you again for being here and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Take Thank care you, everybody. And I, and, I, and I know you gave a shout, Thanks, you gave a shout out to, to Peace Skill Pride, but I do see Brian Fassett um, in attendance, you know, wanted to thank him as well. Um, and again, please go to the peaceskill.org site. Thank you, everyone. And thank you all. Ben, I see you there. And um, thank you for, for your partnership. Thank, thank you, everyone. Great job. Thank you. Have a great thank day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.